Hello again, my name is Vaughn Cooper. In this video, I'd like to share what we're learning about the ongoing evolution of the novel coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. I'm a professor at the University of Pittsburgh in the School of Medicine, an evolutionary biologist and a microbiologist. This video was made possible by our Center for Evolutionary Biology and Medicine with input from our colleagues. One of our major goals in the center is to communicate how evolution is important for medicine and how it can help us fight this pandemic. So to start, let's take a deep breath, and not freak out. Mutations happen, it's a fact of life. The goal of this video is to help make some sense of this. More specifically, first, to provide a more in-depth sequel to my first video on SARS-2 evolution that's suitable for classes in high school or college. Second, to address fairly rampant concerns and some misunderstanding about the role of mutation and evolution in the management and treatment of this pandemic. And third, to share that the ongoing evolution of SARS-2 coronavirus should not be concerning. We have plenty to worry about already. However, we can learn from its evolution and we might be able to use this to develop some new treatments. So to help us understand how this virus population is accumulating mutations and evolving, we're going to have to do a little bit of math. I'll try to make it as painless as possible. So as of today, April 1st, 2020, there are approximately 1 million reported infections. This is certainly an underestimate, but it won't affect the following calculations, as you'll see. Let's also assume that the average reproductive number is 2, which is the number of new infections each infection is causing. The number of times this virus has effectively doubled, causing new infections is therefore log base two, 10 to the sixth, which is 20. Likewise, if we change our estimate of R0, the reproductive number to be three, the estimate changes to only 12.5 generations. So this means that the total number of serial infections is between 12.5 and 20. And if the total number of infections is actually 2 million or even 4 million, then this number of serial infections increases by only one or two. So this means that the virus population is quite young in an evolutionary sense. However, that's not the whole story because we want to figure out how many mutations might be happening. Although it's hard to know exactly, within each infection about 30 viral divisions occur, to create a, reach a population of about a billion viruses within each human who's infected. With this estimate, we multiply by the number 20 from the previous slide, and this means that each SARS-2 lineage has undergone about 600 total divisions. Now, coronaviruses have low per base pair mutation rates for RNA viruses, but their genomes are pretty large for RNA viruses. So based on estimates I've gathered from the literature, we can estimate a range from about 0.2 to one mutations per genome replication. And this produces an expected range of 120 to 600 mutations per genome. However, we see much fewer mutations than this. So this is the latest snapshot from the amazing website nextstrain.org, showing an analysis of about 2,500 genomes of this virus around the world. If we build an evolutionary family tree of all these genomes, and for more information about this, please see my prior video, each virus circulating today has an average of about seven mutations. This is clearly less than 120 or 600. We don't even need statistics for this. So this brings us to our first conclusion, that this virus is evolving steadily on the order of about two per month or 25 mutations per year. Most mutations that occur are never actually detected. So why is this? It's because they're lost by random chance or genetic drift or filtered out by purifying selection. In this animation, I show doubling of the virus. And in the second division, some mutations happen, but they're ultimately less fit than the dark blue ancestor and are ultimately eliminated. The original dark blue ancestor is the one that goes on to cause a new infection without any new infections, and their process repeats. So all this, although this snapshot of SARS-2 evolution provided by the international database of these virus genomes may look scary and impossible to manage, most mutations are harmful 
or, 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 or neutral to the virus. And most mutations won't create scary monsters or produce superpowers like they did in the X-Men. So to test this hypothesis, I took a closer look at all the mutations that have been detected in the virus so far. Here's a plot of all the mutations that change the amino acid of a protein in the virus. This is only a subset because some mutations do not change the amino acid. I'm not including the silent mutations because they're less likely to change the virus. This plots a histogram with the frequency of observations on the y-axis and the number of observations on the x-axis. I hope you can see that what I've just animated is that most mutations in this vi database are only seen once in only one virus and never again. And while there are a few dozen mutations that are seen in multiple viruses and a few that are quite common, their high frequency is the result of them having occurred early in the birth of the epidemic and so they've been carried along for the ride. There's no evidence that they affect the function of the virus. So we shouldn't be alarmed if there are slight genetic differences among viruses for two, producing two genotypes, eight genotypes, or even a thousand. And in fact, below here is a plot from the experts at NextStrain themselves who acknowledge that some mutations are more common than others but they show no particular advantage relative to other viruses. Rather, the important takeaway is that there are plenty of rare mutations, but the clues these mutations provide is where the viruses came from, that is their epidemiology, and not anything about their severity or function. I spoke more about this in the previous video if you want to check it out. So I'd like here to echo the words of a couple of experts in viral evolution who said in well-regarded scientific journal articles, we shouldn't worry when a virus mutates during disease outbreaks, and mutations can reveal how the coronavirus moves, but they're easy to overinterpret. Again, we need to take a deep breath about this sort of data. However, there's, here's where I'd like to add my own spin on this as an evolutionary biologist. This viral evolution can reveal some clues about which virus genes are more critical to the virus and its function than others. To help explain what I did, let me tell us, share a story from World War II. This is pretty famous for people in social sciences. In fact, some experts are comparing this pandemic to World War II, so maybe this comparison is appropriate. A group of Navy engineers was studying where their bombers had been hit by enemy fire to learn how to improve their design. And so I'm showing a schematic that summarizes all the places where bullet holes were found on those, those bombers when they came back to base. You can see that the bullets are not distributed uniformly. In fact, there are some areas where there are no holes at all. The point is that the damaged portions of returning planes show locations where they can sustain damage and still return home. Those that are hit in other places don't survive and never made it back to base. Those are really critical spots to the plane, right? So they're missing those bullet holes. We can apply the same logic to analyzing the locations of the viruses that change the amino acids in the viruses. Here's a plot of all the unique mutations found in each gene of the virus genome. I've also calculated their expected distribution if they occurred randomly according to the size of each gene. So the big peak in the middle of this plot for the NSP3 gene is the result of it being a large gene. It's just a big target. It sort of got a lot of shots, if you know what I mean. And if you compare the expected mutations in black with the, sorry, observed mutations in black with the expected number in red, they're very similar. So it's accumulating these mutations fairly randomly. However, if we look at the two highlighted sections here, we see that the black observed bar is less than the red expected bar by about 30 to 50% each. These two regions turn out to encode the RNA polymerase enzymes that make new copies of viral RNA in key helper proteins. These genes are just not as tolerant of mutation, and when hit, the viruses die off. They're shot down just like the bombers. As it turns out, these enzymes encoded by these genes are, are targets of the promising antiviral drug known as remdesivir, which has shown activity against MERS, a related coronavirus. So to conclude, evolutionary patterns can help us find drug targets, 
by identifying genetic regions that don't change much. Here's a picture showing the enzymes found in the original SARS virus and the current SARS-2 virus are very similar and potentially susceptible to the same drugs. Overall, we can, we've learned that SARS-2 CoV-2, sorry, SARS CoV-2 is evolving, but it's doing so relatively slowly for an RNA virus. There are already many different viruses, but the differences are mostly silent and rare. There's no evidence that these viruses affect viral function or disease outcome. The more common mutations evolve by chance during the birth of the pandemic, and selection is mostly weeding out harmful mutations, and where they are absent can provide clues about targets for antiviral therapies. I want to thank you very much for watching. I look forward to your comments. Please share it if you like this video. And a very special thanks to my colleagues in our Center for Evolutionary Biology and Medicine and to colleagues around the globe who are doing incredible work to enable lightning-fast collaborative research on this virus.